You know, I always like to take the opportunity to stand up and say that I love the Lord and I'm thankful that he saved my soul. Uh, you know, that song they were just singing, as I was thinking about, you know, coming up here this week, uh, you know, it's always a good thing to, to go back and remember the time when, if you have accepted Christ, when that time happened in your life. You know, we can always go back to that point in time. And, and uh, for me, as I, you know, as I was praying about this and thinking about it, it restores that joy that, uh, that, we, that we have whenever we accept Christ. I was about nine years old uh, when I started realizing that, uh, you know, I needed something in my life. You know, I was raised in church, and I'd always heard the, the, uh, the gospel preached, and uh, uh, it wasn't until I was about nine years old I started, you know, really getting concerned about it and, and realizing that I needed to do something. And I was trying to understand everything that, that went on. And uh, our pastor at the time, uh, Brother Graves, Booker Graves, uh, he took me aside one time and went through the, the gospel and uh, was explaining some things to me. And, and I knew, I, I kind of knew what I needed to do. And, and I, I guess I was just kind of shy at the time or whatever. But uh, it wasn't until the next year when I was 10 years old, we went to church camp. Uh, we, we went to Bog Springs. And uh, I had a bunch of my friends with me. I th and we didn't have a big group back then. I think there was six or seven other boys, and I don't remember how many girls. We didn't really care about the girls at that age, but <laughs> not too much. But uh, there was a couple of my friends that had accepted Christ, and and you know through the week they kept asking me, you know, you know, when are you going to be saved? When are you going to be saved? And I, you know, I was doing the normal kid thing. Well, I'll, I'll go up there tonight. You know, I'll. I'll go up tonight, you know, and Tuesday night went by, and Wednesday night went by, and, and it wasn't until on, on in the week, I really started thinking about it and hearing, you know, through the lessons and, and uh, that sermon that Thursday night, you know, he said something that, uh, uh, you know, I, I always, it always resonates in my mind that, uh, you know, if something were to happen to you whenever, you all, whenever you leave here, you know, where would you go? You know, what would happen? Where would you spend eternity? And I really got to thinking about that. And, and so that evening, I, I found the courage to step out. And once I took that step, you know, it was easy to get up there. And I, at that time, my, our pastor was uh, Brother Larry Jones here at Rosalon Missionary Baptist Church here in Tulsa. And he took me off to the side there, and, and he explained it very in, in detail what I needed to do. And that Thursday night there at Bog Springs, I asked the Lord into my heart. And, you know, I always go back to that point, and I can remember that was the most wonderful time in, in my life. I can still re remember that feeling I had. My mom was there as a sponsor that year, and, and whenever, whenever we got done and I got up, you know, everyone had already dismissed, but there was uh, my mom and all my friends sitting there waiting for me. And uh, I, can, I can still remember that, that point in time where... Uh, it's like all the burdens were lifted. You know, at nine years old, you don't really have a whole lot to worry about. But I knew that, that my life had changed at that point. And uh, so that's always something I, I like to go back and think about and, and realize that, uh, you know, I, I accepted Christ. And I truly, I knew that I had done that. Because in his word, he says, for whosoever shall call upon him shall be saved. And, you know, that, uh, w when you get to that point, it's, it's the most wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, it can never, uh, never be taken away from you. And uh, don't have to worry about that anymore. And from that point on, you know, I knew that, uh, you know, I wanted to live my life for God and uh, do the things that, uh, that he wanted me to do. And uh, thankfully, I made it through all my teenage years without getting in too much trouble and uh, met my wonderful wife, Tammy, wherever she's at. <laughs> and uh, uh, the Lord has really blessed me in my life. And... Uh, I thank all of you, that this family here at Florence Street. Uh, I'm, I'm so glad that I'm a part of this. Uh, I'm so glad I'm a part of this family. And uh, each and every one of you means so much to me and my family. It's just a wonderful thing. Thank you. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your Bibles and find your place in Exodus chapter 4, if you would. Exodus chapter 4. The last time I spoke to you, in our series on the life of Moses, I left you with some thoughts, some probably some unpleasant thoughts, and we came to that really strange passage of Scripture where Zipporah 
got up and circumcised her son and, and so told Moses, A bloody husband aren't thou to me. So if you missed the circumcision sermon, I'm sorry that you missed out on that. You can go back to YouTube and check that out. You know, and I begin to think, how do you even follow up a sermon like that? You know, <laughs> what, what, what do you do next? And so, uh, but I was comforted after preaching that sermon. I, I was fascinated by those scriptures, and I, and I explained to you how that I had read that over and over again, but was just perplexed that God had such a great task for Moses, and then right after that, seeks to kill him. And I was perplexed by that, and I wanted to preach that passage, and Brother West is probably trying to talk me out of it. But I was comforted that I saw Mike, uh, Mike Calvert at Walmart after church that night. He said, I loved your sermon. And he said, I've never heard anybody preach uh, about Zipporah circumcising her son. And I said, well, I'm glad somebody enjoyed that sermon. I, I know I enjoyed preaching it. Tonight, we're going to pick up right where we left off. That little segment right there, I think, was so important to the obedience of Moses to God. It was more than just a circumcision. It was more than just an act of a covenant. It was complete and total surrender and obedience to God that he was looking for in the life of Moses. Because right after that, God picks right back up where he was. He said, you know, Moses, I want you to go, and, and I had this great task for you to do, and you're going to lead my people. And Moses went through all the excuses why he couldn't go, and, and God said, no, but I'm going to be there, and I'm going to give you the words. And I'm going to give you Aaron, and he's going to speak for you. There's no excuses. You tell him that I sent you. I will have you to do signs, and there's this great task to do. And then God seeks to kill him. God doesn't try to kill him because God doesn't have to try to kill people. But God puts him in a spiritual chokehold, and, and then once he gets back into obedience to God, and Zephora does what she's supposed to do, immediately God goes right back to the task at hand for Moses. And he sends Aaron... To help him. Now, I don't do a lot of, of football or sports analogies and illustrations. In, in the five years I've been here, I haven't done many. So you're going to indulge me tonight, okay? I have refrained for many years. But tonight, we're going to have a football sermon. We're going to huddle up. Would you stand with me? Let's read together Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. Right after these strange, these strange verses... He picks right back up. It says, And the Lord said unto Aaron, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered all the elders of the children of Israel. They're going to have a holy huddle. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And look at verse 31. It says, and the people believed. You say, well, why is that significant? Because if you go back to the beginning of chapter 4, Moses said, they will not hearken to me. They won't listen to me. But God gathered them up. God gave them the signs. God gave them the words. They told the elders, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for all the blessings you give us. Thank you for your word. And thank you for the passages that we don't seem to understand. And thank you for the hidden messages and all the things that are in there that we just sometimes can't see and can't comprehend or sometimes we just don't want to see. Thank you for using your word and your Holy Spirit to convict us and to conform us to your image. And I pray tonight that we would miss nothing. That every word would be to us inspired as it truly is. That everything would be important to us. I pray that you would inspire our hearts, motivate us to serve you like we've never served before. Even though we're tired, even though we're weary, even though we, we see struggles and afflictions and persecutions, teach us how to break the huddle and go to work. May you forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of any disobedience in our lives. Forgive us, Lord, of any laxness in our lives. Complacency. Break our hearts fresh. And help us to serve you with all that we have while it is day. 
And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In football, they have huddles. Now, I told somebody the other day that I was going to preach a football sermon, and they said, well, I don't really know much about football. I said, well, that's not really the point. It's not really to teach you much about football, as much as it was just to have an analogy and have a little fun with the idea of football. In football, they have huddles, and they gather into their huddles, and they give them 30 seconds so they can, they can call a play. That's why they give you a huddle. Now, in a professional football game, you'll have 60, 70,000 people who are on hand watching the huddle. And they're observing as these men go into the huddle, and they don't mind you taking 30 seconds to call a play. They understand that you have to be organized in order to run the next play. They understand that everybody needs to know where everybody's going, that the quarterback needs to know what's going to happen, that the backs need to know where to go and the receivers need to know where to go. They don't mind you calling a huddle. A huddle is a necessary part of the game. But I got news for you. 60,000 people did not pay $80 a ticket to watch a huddle. That's not why they're there. They want to see the huddle break, and they want to see if their team can overcome the opposition who has dared them to snap the ball and move the, field down the, down, move the ball down the field to score against them. They want to see if the practice worked. They want to see if the huddle was effective. They want to see the action that has taken place. What they want to know is what we're doing here in the huddle, did it have any effect on the game at all? Now, we as Christians, we often get high on the huddle. We're big on the huddles. We like huddles. Well, most of us do. The good Christians like huddles. We gather up on Sunday morning, we call a huddle. Everybody huddle up. We all come in. We huddle up in our Sunday school classes. We call a play or two. We come out here. We call a big huddle. We get high on the huddles. And we get down here on Sunday night. We call another huddle. And we call one on Wednesday night. And we all gather in. And, and Brother West comes in the game. He gives us the play. And he says, ready, break. And I think sometimes we don't ever break the huddle. We get high on the huddles. We go down to the restaurant and we say, hey, man, you should have been in our huddle today. We had a great huddle today. Woo, it was good. We had another huddle tonight. I don't know why, but they put the backup quarterback in there. That's me. You know, he's not the play caller our, our original quarterback is, but he's okay. He's just a rookie. He's not bad, but we had a good, we had a good huddle tonight. And, man, my quarterback can call huddles better than your, your quarterback can. Man, he calls plays. Woo. But we never break the huddle. We have our huddles on Sundays and Wednesdays. But sometimes I think we fail to break the huddle. You know, the effectiveness of a team is not determined by how great their huddle is. If their circle is symmetrical, or if the quarterback has a very commanding voice, or they have a great elaborate calling system. The effectiveness of a church is not measured by our Sunday morning huddles. Though we would like to think that it is, we'd like to have a big huddle. We want everybody in the huddle, right? We want a good play called. We want the starting quarterback in there. And all of a sudden, not people said amen. We want the starting quarterback in. We want to have good huddles. But the test of a church is not determined, does not measure, is not measured in what they do on Sunday morning and Sunday night. You see, the measure of a church is seen in the impact of that church once they break the huddle, once they get to the marketplace, once they get to work, once they get to school, how they've impacted their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ, how they've touched the community that's around them once they break the huddle. That's how you measure the effectiveness of our church. Because we can have great huddles. We can have, you know... And the same can be true of people who don't have great huddles. Did you know a good friend of mine, Doug Gregg, he pastors a church in Owasso, Oklahoma. And it's a small church. They have a small huddle. They gather up on Sundays. They don't even have Sunday night huddles, so they don't even have a building to huddle in. And uh, that's a church of less than 100 people. And every year they do something. Now, it's something that most people may not approve of 
every year they have what they call an egg drop. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty interesting thing. It's, it's probably nothing that I would ever do. But it's pretty interesting. And this little group, this little huddle of about 75 people or less, that's 75 children in all, and everybody who would come as a visitor. But the core group of their church every year buys and sometimes stuffs tens of thousands of eggs. They get a helicopter, and they go out into a park, and they get the city park, and they drop tens of thousands of eggs out. And you say, well, that's, well, that's, not, uh, that's not a good thing, Brother Rains. I'll tell you what it is, though. It's an evangelism tool for them to get 8,000 people from their community into one spot at one time. And while the eggs are dropping, you know what their church is doing? Their church is out there handing out bags that say Life Point Baptist Church and saying, Hey, my name is Dustin Mitchell. I'm the, I'm the music leader at this church right here. And I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ. If you died today, do you think you go to heaven? And they use that. They bring other churches into their community to witness to these people who are going all through the park. And every, the, the year I went, a couple years ago, I went up there. They recruited me to come be a soul winner for their egg drop. And I'd ask people, I'd say, what do you know about the church that's hosting this? They say, I don't know, but it, it must be a huge church to put all this stuff on and have the radio station here and all that stuff. i say, it's a church of less than 75 people. They go, no way. There's no way that a church that small can have this big of an impact. You see, a church's success is not measured it's not measured by the size of their huddle, but it's measured by the impact that they have in their community once the huddle is broken. We don't have to have a huge huddle to be effective. Another guy I know he started uh, pastoring a church in Arkansas, a small church. He said all we did was grab our Bibles and gospel tracts and walk through our streets. He said we didn't have hardly anybody in our church. But we began to walk through the streets, and everywhere we went, people began to recognize us. Those are the walking Christians that are always walking down the street. That church is a church of over 300 people today because they got out in their community and began to knock doors. Lancaster Baptist Church in the year of 1986 had 12 people in their huddle. 12 people, almost the size of an actual football huddle. And today, when they huddle up on Sundays, they have about 5,000 people in their huddle. You know why? Because their pastor said, I went out to the desert with the King James Bible under my arm, gospel tracts in my pocket, and a heart to win souls. You don't have to have a large huddle to have a successful church. You just have to break the huddle and do something in your community. See, I'm all for huddles. I love huddles. I was a quarterback in high school. I love to call huddles. I got to do all the talking in that huddle, too. Sometimes people would talk up and you just tell them to be quiet. I'm not against huddles, but I'm all for breaking the huddle and moving into community. Our ladies this week hosted an amazing event, and it touched the lives of a lot of people. That's breaking the huddle. We partner in education with this school back in our neighborhood, and we, we get a chance to witness these people and, and share information about our church and minister to that church. That's breaking the huddle. We have outreach programs which we get to knock on doors and visit with people and share the gospel. That's breaking the huddle. That's what we have to do is break the huddle. In verses 27 through 31 here, that's what we have. We have a, a holy huddle of sorts. Coach God is calling a play into Aaron and who is sent to Moses. And they discuss the play and then they gather the rest of the team, the elders of Israel together, and they tell them the play. But then they break the huddle. And if you go over to chapter 5, verse 1, you say they broke the huddle and they went to work. It says Aaron and Moses went up together and went into the court of Pharaoh and said, Hey, Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. They broke the huddle. It's okay to have a huddle. We just got to break it. This is exactly what we are to do. We are to hear the play from God. Our quarterback, Pastor West, calls to play for us every week. And we are to break the huddle and go on to the opposition. Now I want to show you a few things about the huddle. Notice the fir uh, first thing here. Notice, first of all, it begins with proper leadership. Verse 27, you see who's calling the shots here. It says, And the Lord said unto Aaron, A proper huddle begins with proper leadership. Just like every good team, you need the right person calling the shots for your team. There are schools who will pay millions and millions of dollars to have the top coach in the nation calling their plays and running their show. We have a far greater coach than any coach in America. We have God. He is calling the plays. He is our spiritual signal caller. And he calls in the place to us into our huddle, and we need to listen. 
Now I want you to notice a few things about our leadership. Notice his comforting providence. His comforting providence. Going all the way back to the beginning of Moses' life, we can see the hand of God's divine providence and protection upon him. You go all the way back and you see the God working through the midwives to not, to not kill the Hebrew children. We see him protecting Moses on the river as he is not consumed by the beast of the river. We see him placing Moses in the house and in the courts of Pharaoh to train him up just for the day that we're about to see in chapter 5, verse 1. All of this stuff is happening by the divine providence of God in the life of Moses, all to bring us to chapter 5, verse 1, when he goes back to the courts of Pharaoh. We see him leading Moses to Midian for his training on the backside of the desert. We see him speaking to Moses in the burning bush. And now we see him working all of these things out so that Moses has the help that he needs to get the job done that God's called him to do. He has comforting providence. Isn't it nice to have that kind of leadership? Who knows what's going on all the time? Isn't it good to have a coach that's been there? He's seasoned. He knows what's going on. Listen, our coach is far better than anybody else. He knows what's going on. And not only does God know what's going on when he's asking us to serve him, he's orchestrating it all behind the scenes to make it happen. That's comforting to me. It's comforting to me to know that God, who's telling me to go, is going before me. Notice, secondly, his commanding presence. Verse 27, he spoke to Aaron and said, Go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Coach God, but speaks and his voice commands respect and response. That's the kind of coach you need. You know the leadership is good and has a commanding presence when he but speaks. And there's no questions. There's no debate, but simple obedience on the part of Of those who hear him. Aaron hears God. And he responds. Matter of fact Matthew Henry said in his commentary. I like what he said. He said that Aaron was told to meet him in the wilderness by God. Yet Aaron made such haste in obedience to God. And in love to his brother. That he actually met Moses in the mount of God. The place where God had met with him. He had a commanding presence. He said, Aaron, go. And Aaron arises and makes haste to go to what God wants him to do. Let's let's get a huddle called up. And then let's break it. Here's the play, Aaron. You're going to go in and tell Moses that I've sent you in to. See, when I was in school, that's what we did. We didn't have fancy signals. Now they got fancy signals. And they call all this stuff. And they don't mean anything to anybody else but those people. But when I was in school, they sent somebody in to tell you the play. Guy would come off the sideline, come and whisper in my ear, tell me the play. I'd go into the huddle, I'd tell them, and then we would break the huddle and go to it. He said, listen, I've already told Moses, but here, I'm going to tell you too. Now, you go back and talk to Moses, you discuss it, bring the elders of Israel together, tell them the play, go to it, break the huddle. He has a commanding presence. That's the leadership we have to have. Proper leadership, God's leadership. Notice thirdly here, let us see. His complete preparation. The best coaches leave no stones unturned. They make all the necessary preparations before moving forward with their plan. Now I want you to know something about our coach. He is going to do whatever it takes to make sure everything is ready before we run the play. And notice that not only did he prepare Moses, he prepared Moses. He spoke to Moses in a bush. And he said, Moses, here's the plan. And Moses made excuses. But he said, no, here's the plan, Moses. We're going to do this. But not only that, he prepared Moses, uh, Aaron as well. He spoke to Aaron just as he spoke to Moses. He prepared both parties to meet and go do what he told them to do. Now I want you to know something about God. Our leadership, the man who's calling our plays, understands preparation. I want you to know this. Whatever God is calling you to do, while he's preparing you to do it, He's also preparing the hearts of those who are going to help you to accomplish it along the way. Let me illustrate that for you. If you would have told me 16 years ago when I was in high school playing football that today I'd be standing before you preaching, I'd have told you no way. In 2002, on December 29th, 2002, I rededicated 
my life to the Lord. And I don't know what that means, and I hope people watch this on YouTube. I don't know what that means to anybody else, but here's what it meant to me. That from this day forward, I'm going to change who I am. I'm not going to be the same person. I'm not just going to say a little prayer and then get up and walk out and lay out of church next Sunday after I rededicate my life to God. It means I'm starting over and I'm committing my life to God like I should have done years ago. That's what it means to me. On December 29, 2002, I walked down the aisle of the church and I rededicated my life to God. And man, God began to work on my life. I'll give my testimony while I'm here too. God began to work. I went to church camp that year. And I was doing everything in our church I could find to do. I was trying to help and teach Wednesday night teenage classes, help lead the music, pray and take an up offering, whatever you want me to do, come into prayer meeting. Still, there was something in here that was unsatisfied. There was an irrepressible message in my heart. I went to church camp that year, and I didn't go to the sponsors meeting, which is a no-no, because you'll get volunteered for stuff and you don't show up for the sponsors meetings. Let that be a warning to you. And my pastor comes back and said, hey, I volunteered you to do a devotional in front of all these people on Wednesday morning. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I was petrified. And I thought, well, I know one verse, John 3, 16. I guess I can talk about that. He said, no, you can do better than that. You got to a Wednesday. Don't worry. You, you know, everybody does John 3, 16. You do something different. So I was petrified. And I got up and I gave a devotional. What I thought was a devotional, someone else told me later it was a sermon. And uh, out of Romans. But puts you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. I'll never forget it as long as I live. When I walked off that stage, I thought, man. That felt pretty good, but there's no way God's calling me to be a preacher. No way. I went back to my cabin. I had a guy stop me. You might know him. I won't mention his name because you might know him. But I had a guy stop me, and he's like, when did you surrender to the ministry? I said, I haven't. There ain't no way. He said, brother, uh, you're already preaching. You might want to just go ahead and surrender. And I said, no way. So I began to, like Moses, make all the excuses about why I could never be a preacher. And among those excuses were was, my wife will never, never go for this. And I'm saying, well, God, you know, listen, I, I appreciate the offer. But there's no way my wife is going to go for this. She didn't marry a preacher. And I, I struggled with this. I struggled with what God wanted me to do and how I was going to get it done. And what I did not know is that while God was preparing my heart for the gospel ministry, He was preparing my wife's heart too. I remember my first sermon. The night before, two days before, I preached my first sermon. This is my testimony. My wife and I had a fight about me surrendering to the gospel ministry, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't very nice. She said, well, I'm going to tell you how mean she was first. She said, well, you're only doing this because your daddy's a preacher. And I said, if you only knew what it was like to be a preacher's kid, you would know that's like the top reason to not ever do this. And I said, well, how would you know what God wants me to do? You're not even saved. How could you even be saved? I was angry. She was angry at me. and It was an ugly ordeal. She was saved. I was just being mean because she was being mean first. Very Christian thing to do, right? And I remember we came back from that trip. Her father was getting remarried. And that Sunday night I was going to preach my first sermon. And I thought, how am I going to do this? My wife is not even on board for this. I preached my first sermon, and in a church where the only feedback you got were crickets, literally. I grew up in the boringest church that ever existed. Amens were a premium. You had to do it yourself. 
It was a do-it-yourself kind of church, you know what I mean? Nobody ever came to the altar. Nobody ever came up and prayed. None of that stuff ever happened. When I finished my sermon and gave the invitation, the altars filled. And the first one was my wife. She said, I have no doubt God's called you to preach. I did not know that while God was preparing my heart, he was preparing her heart too. That's what God does. You see, complete preparation. He prepared Moses, and Moses said, I can't do this. But while he's preparing Moses, he's over here preparing Aaron too. You're going to have help. Whatever God's called you to do, friend, he will not leave you unprepared. He'll prepare others too. So the huddle, it begins with proper leadership. Secondly, it builds with powerful partnerships. Never underestimate the power of a partnership. People who are in tune with one another, people who share common interests and passions and goal can be hard to deal with. Notice the record of good partnerships. If you go back and check the records, you'll find that there are many more dynamic duos than there are people who were single great people. Since we're talking football, you got Terry Bradshaw and Lynn Swan. Bam, right there. There's a dynamic duo. Some of you remember Dan Fouts and Kellen Winslow. Bam, there's a dynamic duo. Some of you remember Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. My personal favorite, Troy Aitman and Michael Irvin. Those are dynamic duos. There are powerful duos. When there are two people in tune with each other, they're hard to deal with. And you go into the Bible, you see the same thing, the same concept. Check the record. You have Moses and Aaron who accomplished great things for God. You had Paul and Barnabas who accomplished great things for God. You have Paul and Silas. Anybody who Paul was with was going to be a dynamic duo. You have people uh, like Peter and John. Then you have people uh, like Dwight West and Matt Range. Dynamic duos are all over the place. Finally, five years. Give me five years to get amen out of him. The records show. When Jesus, in Mark chapter 6 or 7, when he sent out the disciples to preach the gospel, he sent them out by twos. The records show that partnerships are hard to break. You have a good partnership. You need to use that partnership. And that's what our huddle is about. That's why we come together. That's why we have small groups. That's why we have prayer groups. That's why we have fellowships. Hey, listen, don't leave from the fellowship. That's where you build powerful partnerships. And when you get two Christians who are in tune together, who work together, who have a common ground and a common goal and a common God, they are very powerful and hard to deal with. The record shows that duos are hard to deal with. Notice, secondly, the reassurance of good partnerships. You know, one of the most difficult things about ministry is relationships. Yet one of the most wonderful things about ministry is relationships. How to relate the ability to relate to those above us those below us those around us those people in our church how to relate to people in your church in your huddle is crucial to the ministry to the success of this church let me tell you about one of the greatest temptations in ministry And I say ministry, I'm not talking about me and Brother West and Brother Sam. I'm talking about our ministry once we break the huddle. One of the greatest temptations in ministry is to stop reaching out and investing in other people. Because partnerships can be broken. Friendships and relationships and fellowships can be broken. And one of the greatest temptations in ministry is to draw back and say, I'm just going to keep everybody right here. Because you get hurt. You watch people come and go, and, you, and the very people you think love you and would go, to, would go to battle with you are the ones that sometimes hurt you the most. But man, when you get a good partnership, it can be a great thing. I value your friendship. It hurts me to know that anybody in here would not consider me their partner in the ministry, in the work of God. Partnerships are important. 
When you stop investing yourself in other people, you cease to be what God has called you to be. And when you stop partnering with other people in the gospel, you cease to be as effective as you could be as well. A lot of power in partnerships. I want to share with you why partnerships are good. Three things very quickly, and then we'll be wrapping it up. Partnerships are good because they give you comfort. They give you comfort. Knowing that somebody else feels your pain and understands your ups and your downs. Having that partner. Having somebody there who you can cry on their shoulder or you can rejoice with them. And many of you in this church have that partner. You have that accountability partner. You have that friend, that companion. Value that partnership. If you don't have it, make that partnership. Find somebody in this church you can connect with. They give you comfort. Secondly, they're important because they give you companionship. When we finally break from the huddle and we go to work for the Lord, we find ourselves at times feeling very much alone. It's good to have a friend. Many times in, in God's work, you want to quit. You know, when I played football, we a few times got into those games where you just wanted to pack up and go home. You've watched those games. At halftime, the game was over. They were licked. And you wanted to go home. I played in a game like that. You just want to go home. But you know what? In the ministry, it's the same thing. You're going to have times when you're down and times when you're, you feel like you're all alone. It's good to have that partner there that tells you, don't quit. Don't quit. Satan wants you to quit. Don't quit. He's whispering in your ear to quit. I coach a little league sports, and all the time I have to tell them, don't quit. Don't you quit on me. Don't you roll over and die. That's what your partner is good for. He's a companion for you. Pushing you along. Thirdly, because they give you confidence. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. They give you confidence. You're bolder when you're with a partner. When Brother West has me there to run diversions on the dogs and run them off, he's bolder. You know? If I had Fred Ob standing behind me, I'd say about anything. Partnerships give you great confidence. And they make you stronger than you would be on your own. I know that when Brother West is with me, I'm a lot bolder than I am by myself. I know other people say, hey, I wouldn't mind going with you on visitation because I just don't want to go by myself. I just don't have the confidence for it. I'll go with you and I'll help you out. And they don't know that while, they feed, while they're feeding off the confidence they get from me, I'm I'm feeding off the confidence I get from them. Amen. Partnerships are good. We have to have them. Whether you like it or believe it or not, we need each other. I need you. And you need me. And we need God to call the signals for us. I want you to notice one last thing as we conclude this message about the huddle. It breaks with purposeful worship. Verse 31, it says, The people believed. And when they heard the word of the Lord, how he visited the children of Israel and looked upon their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. You say, Well, what has that got to do with us? Well, listen, you remember in my opening remarks that I mentioned the impact or success of a church is not measured by the Sunday huddle ups. It's measured by the impact we have once the huddle is broken. We need to break the, the huddle with purpose-filled worship. You see, Brother Raines, when we break the huddle, you, you want us to go out singing? Is that what you want? No, listen. Worship is singing. Worship is giving. Worship is preaching and proclaiming. Worship is even enjoying. You know, the word worship can be broken down to worth-ship. 
Whatever something is worth to you, it will produce certain things, and it will produce singing, giving, preaching, and enjoying and basking in the presence of the God who's calling the shots. But friends, worship is also serving. Worthship. Is God worth it? Is there a cause? When we break the huddle, do we break it in service to God? What is God worth to us? Is he worth enough for us to break the huddle and follow through with his plans? I believe this. I believe God. I believe God has a better plan for Florence Street Baptist Church than Sunday huddles. I think he has more. We just got to be willing to break the huddle and move forward. I want to ask you tonight. As our musicians come and we prepare for a song of invitation, I'd like to ask our candidates, if everybody just go ahead and stand with us. My brother West and our two young men, Jesse and Jacob, come on back. You guys can come on back and go with Brother West. As they prepare for baptism, I want to ask you, don't you think it's about time to break the huddle? I think it's time to do something wild, something different. You know, when I was in high school playing football, we, my coach, who was not God, <laughs> though he did go to my church, he wasn't God. He was an ex-running back, and I was a quarterback. I hated his play calling. He always wanted to run right up the gut. His favorite saying was, three yards in a cloud of dust, boys. That's all I want. Three yards in a cloud of dust. I hated that. I was thinking five steps and let it fly. I always wanted to do something wild. And I was always scheming and saying, hey, coach, we went to the same church together. He was a Sunday school teacher at my church, and I was always like, hey, coach, I got this great play. I think it'd work. He's always, no, come on now. Three yards in a cloud of dust, son. It's all we need. I hated that. I still hate that. And I would scheme up another play. No, we can't do anything crazy, Brother Matt. Same old thing, Brother Matt. Huddle up. Three yards in a cloud of dust. You know what? I see the same thing in our churches. Huddle up. Three yards in a cloud of dust. Huddle up. Let's have VBS. Huddle up. Let's go to church camp. Huddle up, let's have a fellowship. That's three yards in a cloud of dust. That's all that is. Every now and then you want something different. One time he let me call my own play, and it was brilliant. (laughs) It resulted in a 70-yard touchdown pass. And I danced all the way to the sidelines going, yeah, sometimes three yards in a cloud of dust just isn't that good, is it? Every now and then, it's, it's good to go deep. I don't think we break the huddle and go deep very often. I think it's time for our church to break the huddle and go deep. Do something different. Reach our community. If it's something, if it, well, Brother Rains, we've never done that before. So what? So what? We've never done it before. Well, we've always done it this way. Well, that's worked really great. We've got three yards in a cloud of dust. That's great. Something different. What about in your life? Would you be willing to do something different? Would you say, you know what? All my life I broke the huddle and I went home and I went to work and I was a good person at work and people could see that I was a good person. That's three yards in a cloud of dust, friends. How about you break the huddle tonight and you go to work tomorrow and you witness to somebody? How about you go to work tomorrow, you break the huddle, and you go deep, and you take a gospel track with you, and you say, hey, I go to church down at Florence Street. we got a crazy backup quarterback, but every now and then he calls a great play. And hand him a track and say, why don't you come to church with me today? Something different. Someone told me a long time ago, said, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got, right? You ever wonder why everything's always the same? Maybe it's because we never do anything different. God's speaking to your heart tonight about changing something in your life. Change it. Do something different. Brothers, we're going to baptize tonight.
like James and John, Peter and Andrew. I pray that God will use these young men in a wonderful way. And it will be a, a great blessing to many others as they follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesse's coming first. This is Jesse McMurray. The heater didn't work too good. It's a little chilly, so we'll get them out as fast as we can. So I got to suffer for the Lord, right? <laughs> he went, Jesse, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he came and died on the cross for you? That he rose from the dead and sent him to heaven? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? All right, upon your profession of faith, I baptize you by the authority of Lord Street Baptist Church in obedience to Christ's command in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. And we have his brother Jacob. And Jacob was just saved last Sunday. His brother had been saved and not been baptized. Jacob. I want to ask you the same thing I asked your brother. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do you believe he died on the cross for you? That he rose again, ascended to heaven, coming again? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? All right, upon your profession of faith, obedience to the command of Christ by the authority of Florence Street Baptist Church, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> 